So while our days didn't overlap often, I always appreciated the energy Graham Richardson brought into the newsroom. He has an energy and an enthusiasm for current events and for people and definitely for stories. Graham is the current chief news anchor for CTV News at 6 and afternoon uh, the news anchor on News Talk 580 CFRA. So he's married. He's the father of two boys. He has traveled all over the world covering major news events. He's lived in L.A. He's brought us the headlines from Parliament Hill. And more recently... He is inspiring us to live healthy, active lifestyles with the commitment to 365 days of active living, which I actually think is a pretty tall order. But then again, it seems like Graham likes to push the limits on a number of different things. (laughs) Welcome to the show. Welcome to Living Your Life with Leanne Lang, the podcast brought to you by Extension Marketing. And for more information, you can always head to extensionmarketing.com. Hi, Graham. Great to see you again, Leanne. This is different. It is different. Yes. Yes. It's kind of like the tables are turned a little bit. Yes. Now, I want to say with a caveat, it's not Leanne Lang style 365. <laughs> I'm not doing what you do necessarily, but uh, it's... I, I'm, I am I'm, inspired well, watching you. you. Yeah. And I mean, it is really 365 days of active living, but you have chosen the coldest, most brutal winter of like all time yes. to do this. Yes. I'm, uh, I, we've, uh, my wife's doing it too. And I'm more outside than she is. So what I've done is I've set my own rules. Okay. And I'm, I'm not, um, uh, you know, I, you, you do give yourself a little bit of, uh, a bit of leeway, but this is what I do. So I live 4k from the station. Okay. So I ride my bike every day back and forth. That's how I commute. I don't count that. Okay, so if, for instance, like today, I had to drive here, which obviously no problem, I've got to drive somewhere else. Um, I've got to do something in addition to when I'm walking back and forth to work, or sorry, when when I'm riding back and forth to work, because it's 15 minutes each way, 12 minutes each way, that's not enough for my for my estimation. So what do I do? Generally speaking, I alternate spinning and cross country skiing. And that will change obviously with the change of the seasons and I get my road bike out as well. So it's essentially, I've got to break a sweat every day for 365. And on a day like today, when life gets in the way, uh, I'll do some weights and I'll do just, I'll do something. So the rule is no couch days. The only thing is obviously if you have a fever, if there's a funeral or something like that, you've got to adjust. You can't hurt yourself. Um, and I knock wood, that hasn't happened. Yeah, because we're, we were, well, by the time this airs, we're at the very beginning of, of March at this point. Yes. I have been, there have been days when I have, because I we follow each other on our social media platforms. There have been days when it's like the, the blizzards and I see you out yes. with like snot, <laughs> frozen, everything. It's I glamorous. mean, it is so, yeah, they're glamorous photos, yes. but you are out there. And it's sometimes it's dark because it's the, it's early morning. Uh, sometimes you're like we're seeing the sun rise like there was some over the over the summer where you were out on these bike like I know that you had already biked an hour before you took the picture yeah you know so I I think it's amazing and I want to get back into how this became so important to you at this stage in life Um, but I want to go back still because we're going to come back to the 365 days of active living and go back to how this kind of evolved and how your life has really evolved I didn't realize you're actually you were born in Connecticut uh, I was. My dad was down on business. Both my brother and I were born there. Uh, dad was working for the Campbell Soup Company in marketing at the time. So we were only there for two years, uh, two and a half years, and we were both it's born. It's enough to get a passport. It's, <laughs> it's enough to get a passport. But what's interesting about that is people don't know this, and I didn't realize this until later in life. It's it's actually quite a burden and um, because America is the only place in the world that taxes based on citizenship, not based on income. Because I'm in a higher tax country, I never owe anything. But every year, I have to file two tax returns to the United States and to Canada. And it is a burden. It is, uh, it's hard to do. I have to get an accountant to do it. And uh, when I found this out is when I was moving to Los Angeles. I didn't have a social security number. I had a citizenship, but I had never engaged with the U.S. government. So this accountant who CTV got me to go see said, this is complicated because you're an American citizen. So you need to file four years of back taxes with the IRS, never owe a penny, but 
four years, it's burdensome, right. right? And your kids and your wife are Canadian. So you have to prove to the American government it's not a marriage of convenience. I'm not making this up. So they can't come in as Canadians. Like if, if I was just Canadian going down to the United States to work. Right, you would be sponsored. There would be a I'd whole be a other- visa. It'd, right. be a v- it'd be very simple. Go in as a Canadian on a mm-hmm. work visa for a Canadian company, done. 30 days or whatever it is. No, because I'm an American citizen, they had to immigrate. It took them three months, lightning fast immigration. Uh, uh, it was unbelievable that we got it done. So they got they got green cards because they couldn't come in as Canadians. They had to come in because I'm an American citizen. Oh wow! Right. So it's it's really complicated, right? And and, it, and yes, most it, people would never even have sure. to deal with this because it's not like they were considering going back or working or that much later in life that they would. Exactly. Be in this opportunity. Exactly. Like wow. and and on paper, wow, mm. you can go across to New York State right now and get a job. Sure, I can. Um, I can go work in the United States as a broadcaster. Wow, right? You know? Um, I don't know. If, did CTV know that they were going to run into these issues yeah. when they're like, let's well, they send, yeah, let's let's send say, Graham over to LA? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, it, it, mm-hmm. they, they found it out and so did I. Right. And they were, very, they were very, very good about it. So anyway, it's interesting. Um, it, it's, uh, and, and the other thing is, on my, I don't have an American passport, but on my Canadian passport, I can get one. I just haven't bothered. On my Canadian passport, it says born in the USA because I was there. And mm-hmm. I, I left when I was six months old. So they call us accidental Americans. And so there you go. And and the in the last five years, because of other countries uh, with higher with lower tax, American the American government is looking for Americans who are trying to hide their incomes. Because I'm in Canada, obviously I'm not that person because our tax rates are so mm-hmm. much higher. But it became they became quite aggressive. Uh, they were they were basically requiring other countries' banks, like all of Canada's banks, to disclose who the Americans they have, who might be Americans, to the IRS. Very serious stuff, right? So if you are not in compliance, a lot of accidental Americans mm-hmm. like me were quite worried, you know? Like, what if the IRS comes after me because I haven't filed, even though I don't owe anything? Or maybe I'm in sort of the Caribbean and I might owe something. So anyway, it's interesting. Wow, I had no idea. Neither did I. Yeah. I found this, this all This out. might be a really, did you, did it ever make it, it into a story? Um, they, they have done stories, not on me, but they've no. done stories on on accidental mm-hmm. Americans and how, like, I mean, the U.S. government is, they used, they, they've called the IRS the biggest collection agency uh, in the world. And uh, and they, they, because there's 300 million Americans plus uh, who make, you know, there's a fair amount of money out there. Mm-hmm. If you're in that bracket where you're, attempting to hide things from the IRS, again, which I am not, um, they, they, uh, they made it a policy to quite, to wow. tighten it. So anyway, um, and, and it's interesting, sometimes, one or two times crossing the border, you get kind of a strange look from the US border because it's like, well, wait a second, you're a Canadian passport. Now I punch into my computer, your kids have lived in the United States, they had status, and your passport says US, what's going on here? And then you just explain it, baby right. left, came back to work. Yes. Everything's fine, but there you go. But it's, it, but it's it shows just... up. It pops up in that system. Sure it does. It's amazing sure what it pops does. up in there. Yes. So that that took a little road that I hadn't expected. Yeah. No, I love it. You, I <laughs> I totally learned something, which yeah. is I had no idea. I had no idea. Yeah. I just kind of was going through. I'm like, I had no idea he was born in the states. Yes. You have an active childhood. You have a healthy childhood. Like what, so, Dad was working for Campbell's. You yes. moved back to back, where in Canada? Yeah, so I grew up in Toronto, West End of Toronto, and then uh, went to Queens for university. And then were I you went, a good student? Were you? I, I knew I always want, interested in journalism. Yes. Okay. I knew I wanted to do this job when I was fifteen. What was that? What was that turning point? Ted Koppel, Sam Donaldson. And Jim Baker, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. Yeah. Remember that scandal? That story. Yes. The first sort of religious celebrity scandal. I was riveted. I couldn't turn it off. And I was 15 years old. I'm sitting there flipping between David Letterman and Ted Koppel on Nightline. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I want to do this for a living. And then, and then that I've always been interested in politics. So it's very funny when I came to Parliament Hill to cover Parliament Hill, uh, Greg Weston, who was still writing for the Sun Chain at the time. I, I came up to him and I said, and I'd met him casually, but I came up to him as I arrived and I said, uh, I read your book, Reign of Error, on John Turner when I was 16 years old, like cover to cover, devoured it at Christmas sort of thing. And he's like, great. You know, <laughs> like you were 16, I wrote this book. <laughs> Greg's a great guy. He's still working on the Hill. But so um, I, that kind of time in the mid 80s, uh, I knew I wanted to cover politics. Pol- I wanted to cover news. 
was it the current events? I mean, that Baker story was was current Trashy. events. That was tra- right. Like yeah. it had it had everything it because did. you had religion, you had business, you had corruption, you had this kind of Hollywood glamour to her, yes. right? These fake, if I remember, yeah, like these Tammy big Faye. lashes. Tammy Faye. Right? Yeah. So what part of it? Was the trying to get to the bottom of the story? Was it the entertainment value? All of it in one. And I think CTV, as you know, like we will never be accused of being snobs. We know what we are. I always say that about six o'clock and about the morning show. We know we're trying to reach them all. We're trying to get what people are talking about. Mm-hmm. So that story was one of the first ones where, you know, the celebrity culture hadn't fully morphed and taken over, but that was that was a turning point where we had this preacher who many people recognize from Sunday broadcasts, mm-hmm. you know, the old school, give us a call, we'll right. save you, give us money. Mm-hmm. And and here he was in this scandal that he'd done things, obviously. I don't even remember what he'd done now, but it was before Jimmy Swaggart and all. And it was just this contradiction. And also what was interesting was the window into America that I just had no understanding of, like just a more church-going religious society, but that was also conservative and had all these hang-ups about sex. Like, th- that's 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 still the story in the United States in many ways. You know? I was gonna. I was saying as I was heading here, do I bring up American politics in this oh, one? Oh yeah. boy! You know, I was like, okay, we'll see. We'll see where this one goes. Mm. So, so you're 15. You're enamored yes. with the storytelling, the story. And so do you then look ahead into, okay, is it journalism? Was it journalism? Was it broadcasting? Was it writing? It was. Could, had you figured that out yet? I hadn't figured no. it out. But I knew I was terrible at math, remain so. I didn't like science. It was like this language I didn't understand. All I could do was read and write. And I couldn't believe I would get marks to do news stories like that to me. So I picked the shortest possible program undergrad. I wanted to well, go away you to did, university. You did Queens, right? Yeah, First. I wanted to go away to university. I did English and politics mm-hmm. there. Wonderful experience, lifelong friends. But I also wanted, I, I wanted to do journalism, but I didn't want to do it for a full undergrad because mm-hmm. you don't need to learn it for four years. So I took a short one-year postgrad at King's College in Halifax. But you had the English, you did the English. I did background. English and politics, See, yeah. I, I think very similar to you, I was horrible at math, mm-hmm. really had not much interest in the sciences, but loved English, loved public speaking. You know, yeah. like if there was a public speaking class, I was like, oh my God, I could tell stories and I can get, like people Absolutely. were like, are you crazy? But you realize we have something in that in that personality that we thrive in that environment. Absolutely. We're so, all A-type, look at me, look at me. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's very Canadian to say, no, it's not. Oh no, my God, but it's so I... true. It's so true. We're all performers. We're all on stage and we all want like, no, no, I've got something to say. That's what our, that's what our drive is, I think. And that's okay. You know what? That's, it is okay? Yeah, yeah. It, it sounds crass, but... but Because I hadn't looked at it that way. You must have Because I'm have not that. a showy. I never thought I was showy, but I did enjoy the process. I enjoyed the process of writing and then presenting. But you're also, yeah. you're a performer. Yeah, I guess. You, that is, you, you know, people want to know what, what is Leanne Lang yeah. doing? Like what, that is part of who we are. And we, uh, for years Plus I thought that. Plus we've also grown up, sure. even you and I, right? We have grown up in this in the spotlight or you started young in your career right and so right. you have grown i have i grew up on television right, right. so it's just it's, it was part of the the entire experience okay right. so you go to uh you're in king's what's you king's went to college queens and, okay. and yeah postgrad for Bernal, uh, right. for journalism at king's college yeah and yeah did you can i ask you like did you write for the newspaper were you interested yeah. in on campus what was happening even yeah. at Queens, when yeah. you... I didn't do as much at Queens as I should have. I was having a bit of you fun. You were having fun? Okay. Um, but the, the thing was, I was around people who had no idea what they wanted to do. Uh, it turned out well for them, generally speaking. But I knew, I knew, like I said, at 15. So all I needed from Queens was a degree. And so, yeah, I wrote a bit for the journal. I did a bit of television at this fledgling student television mm-hmm. station. I would have loved to do something like this. I, I can't imagine what's on campus now with know, the technology. Right? It just must be fantastic. On campus, people can do it in their dorm rooms. Right. <laughs> They've yeah. got the equipment. And yeah. They can do it anywhere. It's, it's amazing. Am- yes, it and, really well, is. And, and I think back, you know, uh, journalism school, we used to rush to the J school to fight over the one copy of the New York Times. And now <laughs> everybody's reading it on the bus. Like it's un- unbelievable it's unbelievable how the world's changed anyway so 
I had to, I don't, we're not that far off in, in age, but I remember having to wait in line at in university for the computer lab. Yes. So I would wait in line at the computer lab to get in to either be able to type up a paper or to send an email. Email was new. Yes. Email was very new. And it was the, the, the newest thing that I could finally write to friends, but I'd have to wait in line to get in. And there'd be lines around the computer lab for us, each student waiting to have their turn. My first internet experience, I was at CBC Calgary, my first job, I was a researcher in the 90s and the internet arrived. Mm -hmm. We had one terminal in the newsroom. And my job, I was part assignment editor because they didn't have an assignment editor, so they hired a cheap researcher like me to do it. It was wonderful. It was a good experience. But anyway, I, I said to my boss at the time, I said, look at this. We can have a camera guy out heading to Banff, and we can search here for the phone numbers and then call them to him. You know what he said to me? He said, yeah, you think anybody's ever going to use it? I, ne I, I, I never forgot that. Like, like at the time, I'm like, come on, this is really big. And now you think about it now. <laughs> yeah, internet. Yeah. You think anybody's ever going to oh use it? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Like, but th there's this resistance. It's not just like, I mean, I was clueless too. It's not like I was Steve Jobs or anything. I was just like, practically speaking, this thing can help me do my job better in the early days because look, there's a Canada 411 on Alta Vista search engine or whatever it was, right? And now it's morphed into, like think about it. Yeah, now it, it's morphed into everything. if you don't have it one second later on your phone, it's like what's what, going what's on? What's going on? Yeah. yeah, what's going on? So I think I read or maybe I had heard because you were talking about Queens and you enjoyed your time there. Yes. Is that where you met Leanne? It is. You met. Yeah. You guys met at university? Yes, we did, yeah. So... Uh, she's from Alberta. Okay. So we met at university. Uh, she was a year ahead. We're the same age, but back then we had grade 13. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I went to Halifax, she stayed in Kingston. And then we literally packed up the Honda Civic and drove out west with a shovel, a uh, $5 Canadian sho tire shovel on the top of the pile of stuff, you know, like, a, and you drove across the country and I started in Alberta. I wanted to start in a place that I hadn't lived. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the reason why I went to Halifax too. I'd never lived there. And I, I, t I tell this to young journalists all the time that it's a really big country. Um, you know, Jeremy Sharon's out in Winnipeg I do. Now. I was so proud of him. Awesome. Just for people that are listening. Yeah. So Jeremy Sharon was... Um, He's kind of like this young punk who worked oh, yeah. in the building, but wasn't quite in the newsroom yet. But he showed up every day looking like a million bucks. Yeah. I got to give him full credit. And he just came in looking the part. Yep. He came in every day looking the part and just right, asking the right questions and figuring out how he was going to get himself in there. And he eventually landed as a producer on our morning show. Right. And so that's how those are the years that I spent with Jeremy. But I but I knew that he had a passion for eventually being on camera. I know sports was really big for him. Yep. And you and like so many in the industry you just do what you need to do to get on air to get on air and so yeah. he got up at 2 30 3 o'clock in the morning for years and became our one of our producers yeah and eventually got the call but yes. with the ctv family to yes. head out and be a, on you know to be a reporter i was so happy to hear that well and he's in winnipeg and mm. you know what i i think especially for people from ontario particularly people from the toronto area there's so many of us who let's say with a family, maybe go down south or go, if you're fortunate, when you're a teenager, go to Europe or whatever it is. Maybe you go to Montreal. So many people in Southern Ontario do not go further out in Canada. Canada is a massive country and it's really important for young people. Saran Fennell is another one. She's out in Saskatoon now. She started in radio for us. She's going to be a good talent, but she needs to get out into the country. And, and, and I'm not saying it's for everyone, mm -hmm. but if you want to be a news reporter and tell the story of Canada, you've got to get out of Ontario. You cannot just stay tell the story from a from an Ontario perspective. Like, look at what's happening on Parliament Hill now. Why is SNC-Lavalin such a big story in the rest of the country? Because Trudeau's favoring Quebec. That's why. It's not who said what and did they cook this. It's an inside deal for a big Quebec company, and that rubs people in the West horribly it reminds them of his father and all that sort of thing so you need if you're going to cover that right. you need to be you need to be able to talk about that but we're out here in ontario looking at what's happening out west with the pipelines and we're kind of going what's the why big deal? is why is this such a big story that's right right so it's it's understanding how our country how 
the resources are used, we have such a large land mass. Yes. So it's interesting. I, I I love our country. I haven't actually seen all aspects. I mean, I've been in every, I sure. think almost, I don't yeah. think I've been to New Brunswick. Yeah. To be honest with you. It's beautiful. I haven't yeah. been through I, I haven't lived there. I've driven through. Yeah, I've, I've, you know, I've stayed but, for a bit. St. John's I mean, turning around and everything. Vancouver, Calgary. At, like, I, I mean, I love being out west. But it's, it's interesting. You wanted to establish yourself or start off in somewhere completely different. Yeah. So I, you had done a little bit of traveling here, but you end up in Calgary. Yes. So I started in Calgary. With Leanne, with who Leanne. is a uh, wife at this point now, or are you just still girlfriend. a girlfriend? You've had yeah. your university fund. She's so following she's, along. Yeah. And she's uh, she's... She takes a post grad in PR, and the, the the big the big uh, the big question was: We were living in Edmonton. I was freelancing. I couldn't get work, and she had to decide between going to college for PR mm-hmm. in Edmonton or Calgary. And we're on a family thing in BC, and I had applied for this job in Calgary. And anyway, we f- I find out I get my first media job at Blue River, BC, because I called back to my answering machine. And I kept calling back with my calling card on a payphone. Oh my God, awesome. I totally yeah. get it, yeah. And I get this call, Bob McLaughlin, please call me right away, Graham. I'm like, oh my God. So Leanne's sitting there and I'm like, uh, I call him and I get the job, right? And I'm giving her the thumbs up. We're moving to Calgary from Edmonton. Anyway, um, uh, so so yes, so four years Calgary. And, uh, and um, you know that moment when you get your first job, you never forget it. And I never, it was at a Husky truck stop. And and it's still there, Blue River. That's where Blue you were when you BC, used that payphone in the and, mountains. And... The payphone is still there. On my twenty fifth year in broadcasting, I looked it up on Google Street View, yeah. and I got a shot of the payphone, and I I sent it out on Twitter or whatever. Just this is where I found out I got my first job, and the payphone's still there. But it's amazing though that you have such a, a vivid memory mm-hmm. of it, right? It was such you'd work so hard. Yeah. People think you just kind of you just lands. It doesn't. No. There was a lot of work that went into it. It's not glamorous, you know that. No, it's not. It's not, and, and it's I'm not I'm not crying poor. Like I mm-hmm. love what i do and you did you do too yeah. um but the notion that it's you know like people it, it's it's extremely hard work and uh there are times when it's when it's less hard but it's it's it is a grind and uh you know uh but y- you have to i guess you have to love it leanne you have to love it to do it if you if you just want to be on tv no, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Yeah, it's not the, the hours and you did it. I I did it. I mean, I I worked weekends. You, that yeah. I started at nine in the morning, filmed everything, edited everything, wrote everything, then did six o'clock news, and then kind of restarted again and did everything again for the eleven o'clock news, and then you know you're yeah. wrapping the day up at midnight, and you're doing that because you need the experience, and if you need it covered, you're the only one that's going to be able to get out there and cover it. And, and all of that, all of that grind makes you who you are on tv like i can physically see when someone like you is on tv versus someone who is less experienced physically in the shoulders i mean it when there is a lack of grasp of and i sound like an old guy but if there's a lack of grasp on the story and the history and the pattern and whether it's the city whether it's city hall whether it's whatever the story is i think in time news reporters in particular physically start to get more comfortable with the material and it takes time it takes time which is why it's wonderful that you can grow in these smaller markets yes as you were saying that we have all of these people that we know that are that are branching themselves out over canada to be able to get this experience learn the stories learn the storytelling and and that's what you did while you were in calgary right like yeah. this, this was you starting getting the exposure yes being on air and 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 learning yeah yeah and i always knew i'd come back like one of my first dream so i did four years calgary four years edmonton and then i came back and famous story in our family jack was born and literally in the delivery room um i told leanne we're moving to toronto (laughs) like like I mean, Jack is born in Calgary, in Edmonton. He's born in Edmonton. And, okay, and uh, like the epidural is wearing off, and I'm like, uh, I got the Queens Park job. We're moving dead to, uh, to, to to Toronto. As Jack is making his yeah, exit, almost, almost. Oh my god, not gosh. quite that bad, but it was it was uh, uh, Leanne's a trooper. It was. Uh, but was that easier being closer to family? 
because I'm assuming everyone was still in Ontario to have my side. Her yes. side's in Alberta, but her side's oh. got deep roots in Ontario okay. too. So it, yeah, it was great to yeah, it was great to come back home in quotes, right? Like that's that's with a baby, sure. And and also also one of my uh, you know growing up, one of my other uh, big things was provincial politics to be able to cover that. Um, as Mike Harris was leaving, Ernie Eves was taking over, and then the changeover to Dalton McGinty. It was an exciting, exciting mm-hmm. time. And I think we're seeing another exciting time down there now with the changeover and obviously the other side coming in. You know, the, the pendulum is swinging. So uh, all of that. And, and, and the other thing, too, is both, both Parliament and Queen's Park, um, uh, beautiful buildings to work in, like to go to, to work every day. It gives you an appreciation for democracy and for the process and uh, for what we have. And even as a political junkie, until you're actually in the building every day, you don't fully understand how wonderful uh, wonderful our system is. It, it gives me a very deep respect for uh, the democ- democracy we have. Is it the history that goes with a building like that? Is it that decisions are being made that are affecting Canadians? What What is it that you feel, that you sense? You know, I walk into the parliament, you, you know, and I'm there to MC some, you know, sure. like, or it's to cover something, you know, but we're in and out, you know. What was it that you felt that was such, that was the appeal? A little story. This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They are a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost-effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally, as I've been using the extension marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one-hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. Everything, everything you said is true, but like all of that, the history, the decision-making, and so... The other thing that really hit home for me, um, I've talked publicly about this before. My mother has a mental illness and my family broke up. And that was when I was in my teen years. And it was very, very hard. And one of the things that never left me was she couldn't work and electricity bills in the 80s started to go way, way, way up. And it caused a tremendous amount of stress in my household. And all of us in a certain income bracket in cities now hear about hydro bills and I hear something very different because I've been there and it is a tremendous burden on a fixed income family a single income or no income so um, when I'm in Queens Park uh, electricity became a fairly hot issue and I became a bit of an electricity geek And my colleagues thought I was just kind of, they appreciated it because Mm -hmm. I paid attention to it because it it reaches right into millions of people's households. It's very, very important policy. Um, So there's that direct connection, but also my history where uh, where it, 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 it really caused a tremendous amount of stress. And so I never forgot that. And in this latest wave of Hydro One, Mm -hmm. of, you know, the explosion of bills, um, it is, you know, I think the premier of the day at the time uh, obviously appreciated what a shock it was to so many families. And it, it brings back a lot of memories. Was it that you understand people's fear, uh, the, um, I'm trying to think of the, I'm trying to think of the right word. Well, it's, because it's, you're, you're so, you're passionate about it, but people didn't understand that it was personal. That it, was, that it was so yeah. personal that you could understand yeah. the dynamics of what was going to be happening in a household yeah. receiving this or yeah. understanding and I, it. And, and, be, and almost like a voice for the people that sure. without really knowing that you were being that, yeah. trying to be that voice. And look, you can't, I'm not a hero for that or anything like that. Don't, don't get me wrong. You know, like I'm not, yeah. It was a different perspective in how you're writing the script sure. for the story. Like if you grow up, if you grow up, let's say, you know, living in Orleans, family stays together, maybe you've got two incomes you know, enough money around for a trip, enough money around, maybe even for a cottage or something. A hydro bill, really? A couple of hundred bucks even more a month? That can crush a family. It can crush a family. So when these, and and, and that that informs 
you know, it basically informed how I covered the legislature um, for Global News at the time. And it was just, I wasn't on a crusade, but I just knew, and, and I also hosted a political show, Focus Ontario. I knew that when when policy people, when politicians talk about, oh, you know, a little uptick here and there and the bills and stuff, no, 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 that's a fixed cost that people, when that goes up, that 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 can that can change lives. So you have this experience on a political front for these kinds of topics. Yes. I'm just going to fast forward you really quickly for a second to mm-hmm. current day mm-hmm. when you're doing shows like the Bell Let's Talk and I'm talking about mental illness and yeah. mental health. How much does your background or what you experienced with your mom play into it? Very much so. Yeah, very much so. Do you appreciate that it's not, would you could you talk about it when you were in your teens about what was going on no. at home? No, because it was, I spent most of my 20s, teens, right up until I was about 30, you know, basically just trying to hold things together and cover it up, right? Like you just kind of, you just kind of, you don't invite kids over, you, you, you know, it, it's just, it's just something to work around. And a lot of my personality, that's what I did. And before Bell Let's Talk, you know, actually in this job, I was just like this, you know, you look for things that really matter to you. I did the food bank and basic income sort of, um, I was a board member there and I was a board member at the Royal Foundation, uh, the Royal Ottawa. And it really, it really matters to me because this, this ripples through generations, right? My kid's relationship with their grandmother is not what it should be because my mom has an undiagnosed mental illness. Um, and she refuses to go get help because why does she refuse to go get help? Because she grew up in the 40s and 50s in Toronto where nobody talks about this stuff, right? It's a stigma. Um, her parents never acknowledged it. it and it, it was, it was, it was obvious. So, and I'm, I know I'm not alone. And so, yeah, all of that informs um, my public view on these things and it, it, it I wouldn't say that it makes you an activist but when you're talking about stories and throwing mm-hmm. around ideas in the newsroom it certainly informs well, what I, the way I the way I approach it and I think for me like having had similar in in my family the trickle effect when you talk about it right that you covered it up in your teens and in your 20s and you just didn't have people come over and you just kind of kept it behind closed doors right behind closed doors but when you have children and there are grandchildren involved and then how how yeah. how do the relationships then form right. how do you discuss what is happening with grandma you, yeah you know, it's it's so much deeper than just the immediate fix and, it and yeah and you don't do that with cancer right no you do but, that's sometimes how you have to look at it yeah. when you're explaining it. Yeah. Is that if, if I know that you're sick, you have a disease with cancer, there's compassion and sure. there's what can I do to help and how can we... How's it going? Yes. And, How's your treatment? You know, and you need to be able to have that exact same discussion. Yeah. My dad years ago said on my mom's side, there was an aunt who was sent away, right? And this is probably in the 20s or the 30s, you know, they used to put people just away and just forget about them if they had mental illness. So I don't know if that informed, it probably, of course it did, it probably informed my mother's approach to her situation or refusal to. Is she still? Yeah. And how, how is that relationship? That's great. I mean, look, she's functioning, Mm -hmm. she's independent, um, you know, we are supporting all, all my brother and I. But it and doesn't end. It doesn't it, end. That's it the thing. It does it's... not end. You, you can do a Bell Let's Talk Day show, but you still have to get off that show and then sure. call home to say, "Hey, mom, how are you doing?" Today? Right, and 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 yeah, and so so it's just the, that that. What was your outlet as a kid? Uh, when you're 16, 17, 18, 19, and you're not having friends come home. And a, lot of, a lot of what, escapism. Where, yeah, a lot of. Where, where, where was it? Really? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's I, I'm sorry for those that are I, that watching, was, <laughs> <laughs> those that are listening. There was, there was a slight, you know. Uh, the drinking uh, the, sign. The, the drinking sign. So of, there was a yes. lot of escapism that mm-hmm. way. There was a lot of partying and, and, and you know. Um, you weren't going for a long cross country n- no, ski but, then or no, a bike no, and, rider and, and, then. It I, wasn't, I, that wasn't I, it. My escape then. was music mm-hmm. and my escape was socializing and all that comes with it. Like I play drums and so I was really into to rock and roll. I would go see You'd bands. You'd drum it out. Drum it out. I would drum it out. Sure mm-hmm. I would. Sure I would. And then, and it's interesting, you talk about 365 and everything. What I've found as I get older is that I was never an athlete. Like I was I, nothing like you. 
Um, and my late 20s, early 30s, I realized the buzz effect of, mm -hmm. of exercise. And I was like, wow, they, like the, the high you get afterwards. Uh, it's, it's hard to describe it, for it someone really who is. doesn't have it. So it, when you're an athlete as a child and growing up, it's innately in you. Yes. You, it's innately that you desire it. So once you've had a taste of it, it becomes part of your everyday because I know that my body functions, my mind functions better once I've had yes. that adrenaline hit of my body moving. But what started it in your 20s and 30s to figure out that there was the bug, that there was an adrenaline that you got? I, How I, did you start on well, that? Well, I think I just I started running when we were in Edmonton um, because I needed, you know, you get to your late 20s and you realize you got to start moving. And I want to say something to you. Mm. Working in newsrooms in those years, sure. people, the smoking section yep. was where everyone was hanging out. Yep. It is a culture of going out for drinks after a show. Yes. So it's a very different, it's not, it's not a healthy. No. It's not a healthy occupation. <laughs> yeah. Or it, at least it wasn't 20, 30 years Yeah, no, ago, I think 30, people in their yeah. 20s, like when they're starting out, they, there's lots of that going on. And, and yeah, and I, I realized, uh, you know, Mid, midway through our Edmonton run, I was like, geez, I, I, and then I tried it. I, I, look, I always loved downhill skiing. So I wasn't like, I wasn't like a couch potato. No, but downhill skiing it's is not, not the, it's, it's not, not, it's it's fun. It's like fun. I, I mean, unless you're really downhill skiing. Right, you're not getting a right. workout. But when people say I went downhill skiing, I'm like, okay, you had, you had physical activity outside. At least you're outside. Right. Yeah. So, so then I, I kind of, I kind of realized that, that, yeah, I, th this light bulb went on. And then, um, and then, yeah, and, and, but, but I'm not, uh, I've always said my body, my body type's not a runner. I'm not Mark Sutcliffe, right? <laughs> like I've got a fairly thick bottom half. <laughs> and so I realized to, uh, uh, you know, knees and ankles and, and all that sort of pounding, uh, that it, it, uh, it wasn't going to work for me that way. And so, so anyway, um, in the last probably 10 years, I really got into, um, uh, got into sports that are easy on the joints and that uh, I can do for long periods of time and get that adrenaline rush. So cycling, cross-country skiing, like it's, it's, it's a wonderful part of life, you know? Yeah, you go for, you go for hours. Okay. I kind of took you off the kilter, That's fine. but, but we, but that was it. It was in the 20s, 30s that you kind of got that bug. To be yeah. To and, and the other, and look, you're on TV, right? You can't, you can't, and like I can, there's a vanity to I, it I, well I can put on five pounds in a weekend easy which adds to 15 on the television totally and so you've got to be aware mm -hmm. of that like like our I I never feel pressure like you know from bosses or whatever I just I know what I look like and I know when I when I need to I need to hit the gym or whatever because it's it really shows it really shows mm -hmm. you know so there you go I found it shows too when you're tired you're tired yeah they can it, it shows everything yeah and and yeah, yeah like yeah you have two boys, and I'll come back to kind of the work environment. Sure. But I'm, I'm kind of trying to go chronologically because yeah, you're, I took you you, off. you're kind of going back. Yeah. You've gone back to Toronto. You're working Queen's Park. You've got two young, and then you have you have Jack, and then you have Bennett. Yes. Um, and two very different personalities. Two, I'm. Yes. It's amazing how different. I mean, it's the same with Jamie and Andy, right? I raised them the same. They are very different kids. Yes. But there's very different interests for both of your sons. Yes. And one took very typical Kenny <laughs> off to the rink, off to the ice rink. You yes. Went. And so Jack is a competitive hockey player mm -hmm. and he's 17 years old and he's finishing his competitive hockey run. Uh, everybody's going to get verklempt, the hockey mom especially. It's hard. Like he's going to university next year. Is so, he going to play? Uh, Does he want to no, play No, he, well, he'll, he'll play... <gasps> Well, he'll play intramural. Like he's double A, right? So all the university teams, yes. they're stocked with OHL players, right? So it's a very, very high level of hockey. Jack's not that high level. So he, he he's going to be... But he was high level enough that it dominated your entire... Totally. His entire life. Yes. And he was... He double was, A still doing that he too. And he was triple A for three years. Yeah. So it, it was it was intense. It was int It's intense. It's wonderful. It's fabulous. And Okay. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Knowing, so he's triple A for three years. Yeah. At what point in triple A are you thinking... Is there a chance in AAA to do go up or do you realize at AAA that he's going to go down a double? Like that for yes. me is probably the biggest turning point that you would have had. So he was a third line checker forward okay. for all of his AAA. And and he was a hard worker defending, uh, defensive forward. I like to talk to him, call him. And I, I knew sort of, he, he surprised me when he made the junior 67s uh, and it was thrilling. And then he had two more years uh, with the Gloucester Rangers, and it was it was it was a, a, an amazing run. Um, and then you, you kind of know if your kid at AAA is not filling the net and he's a forward, you know it's tough. 
right? Mm-hmm. Like it's it, it's it's tough. So and 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 the other thing is size. He's 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 a big kid, but he's not a giant kid. And uh, and they're they're six two six three now. A lot of the kids who play AAA and Junior A, they're big big boys. And and so so I I, I knew about halfway through that. Yeah. What were you? What kind of a hockey dad were you? Uh, I I can be in, intense. <laughs> okay. But not. Um, yeah. I. <laughs> I could, I'll put it to you this way. I've never had a bad experience leaving a team. I, I still talk to all his coaches. Okay. And and I think that's a good test. Um, and the only place where adults are permitted to yell at each other is Parliament Hill during question period and the hockey rink. <laughs> and that's a really bad thing, right? <laughs> like, do you do that in gymnastics? No, you get you get worked up. You do, but because it's not a team, you don't right. have the support. Like, you can't just be sitting there going, you know, I hope this kid falls. Right. Right? You can't do that. You might think that. You might think that, but you can't do that. No. I am a soccer mom, and I have been exposed to the sideline chirping. Sure. Of which I've tried to stay out of it. It's hard. And it's hard. And and. and- but even in soccer, it's not the same as hockey. No, and hockey I, and I like, understand that. Because even some of the soccer parents have children that are, right? Like yeah. I've got a girl in hockey, they have a boy, a girl in soccer, they have yeah. boys. And it's it's a very different breed. My other son, Bennett, played. But did, were you, oh, yeah, did you ever, yeah, like, did you ever fear, though, being recognized for who you were? Oh, sure. And doing the chirping? Oh, or sure. Being, yeah, okay. that's always on your mind because you're right. in public. Right, right. Cause so I'm thinking, how much chirping could you really do well, knowing that this yeah, was the, sure. the same audience that would be tuning in? So you cheer for your child and your team. That's right. what you do. You cheer for your – but at one point during playoffs in AAA, another dad turned to me and told me to go F myself. So that was nice. Yeah. It's amazing what happens to it's parents. It's just it, crazy. It really it's is. crazy. Yeah. But okay. the, 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 on this issue, my younger son Bennett, who's, not, who's a competitive dancer, tried every single sport we put him in. And one thing that stuck with me was basketball. He played a house league basketball. Mm -hmm. And their rules are no challenging the ref by anyone ever. You accept and move on. And it permeates the whole game. So it's not even just parents. It's players, coaches, players on the bench, Mm -hmm. and of course parents. They accept it and move on. It's quite something. It's very impressive. Now, it's obviously, like this in the end, positive atmosphere. Just in like mm-hmm. this is the call. Let's go. Yeah. And obviously, the NBA is different, but uh, th- it was actually really refreshing to see that. You try all of these sports with Bennett. Yes. You already know at this point, Jack is on this hockey. He's on obsessed the, with right. hockey. Where? When did Bennett realize when you had him going through all these different sports, and then he gets into this dance class, and he's like, "Okay, I found it." So he's he's the cartwheel kid on the soccer field. At a young kid, picking flowers, right. doing cartwheels, mm-hmm. right? Just, he's there, but he's not there. He, he, he skied competitively uh, downhill for three years. He was Nancy Green, mm-hmm. uh, ski racing. I loved skiing, so it was a wonderful time. It was really cold for him, but he, he he's a he good skier. It. He did it. Um, and at one of Jack's hockey games, there's music, and he's quite young, and he starts dancing around. And one of the hockey moms, Val, says to my wife, um... You should probably go check out Callie Andrews because all he wants to do is dance. And we're like, what? And we take him there, and that was it. He's there six nights a week. He's teaching. He's, you know, he's doing solos. He's and and the thing about dance is there there still are not that many boys. So he's the center of attention mm-hmm. on all the group numbers. He's and he's fantastic. He's found his thing. It's amazing. How, how different is it as a parent to watch aggressive, crazy, yeah. fast-paced behavior of one sport and child? Yes. And then be able to go and watch a solo performance on a stage. It's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. It's, it's wonderful, wonderful to have. And how are they as brothers in supporting each other doing them? Wonderful. Like Bennett doesn't like hockey. Mm-hmm. He, he's never even well, he, looked he at a game. And he's, he was dancing, dancing in the stands. Yeah. Yeah. And, but he'll he'll go and support his brother every once in a while. And Jack comes to his showcase and, and sees him and is very proud of him, which is nice. It warms my heart to hear that. The, the, the interesting thing about dance is, you know, as a hockey parent, you're there all the time watching the development, watching. Yes. Every, you go at, watch practice, yeah. right? Dance, you're, you're, it's closed doors. You have you're no sh- idea no what's idea. in there. We're going to see his dance. He's been doing this since August. This weekend will be the first time I actually get to see it. 
it's been months, you know, so it's very different. It's hard, uh, but it's wonderful. And you get to pay for the ticket to actually oh. go and actually pay again yes, <laughs> to yes, go watch yes, your kid that's right. that you haven't been able to do because right. they're in a closed studio with closed doors and you can't yeah. see it all year. They used to drive me insane. But it's too. wonderful yeah. though because yeah. it's their world, mm-hmm. right? And and it's a social thing and, you know, they've got their ups and downs. And Anyway, it's cool. I'm actually in agreement though. I mean, not fully the closed doors that you can't see, but I don't get why parents need to stick around to watch a practice. Right. Like I, I would always drop off Andy at soccer and I'll be like, I'll be back in two hours. Right. And there'd be parents that are going, where are you going? Why wouldn't you watch? And I'm like, there's no need for me to, this is my child and the coach and the team. There's nothing I can do. Yeah. And I don't need to sit here. I have things I have to get done. And I, and you know, you get this look like, how, are you not interested in your kid? And I'm like, no. no. Because for me, I got dropped off and I had four hours of training and they dropped me off at the door and then picked four hours later I got picked up and, yeah. and it was fine. So I don't always agree that people need to constantly be, yes, there needs to be somebody there if there's an issue sure. uh, and there's a manager or something, but I'm not going to sit on a I agree. sideline the whole time. But the, the only thing now though is time is ticking and Jack's 17 and he's going to leave town and it's over. And we're both struggling with that. It's hard, right? Like it's a huge part of our life. It's a huge part of our social life. Has been for years. Some of our best friends we met met through through hockey, hockey. you know, and they're still our best friends. Have you had this discussion with these parents that you've been together for years? Like how do you intend? Like we we, we always commiserate about this is the final, you know, this is the last road tournament as we're sitting in a three star and Vaughn (laughs) sipping beers in the hallway. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, it's part of, it's part of the whole experience. I think I I know we're going to look back on that as some of our best parenting years, all of it. But when, and the other thing is we've noticed, you know, because he's driving now, we have more time. And Mm -hmm. when he goes next year, we're going to have lots of time. So, wow, we can go to a movie or, you know, like it's totally different. Did the boys appreciate your dedication to your own physical health, wellness? Yeah, I think so. That, yeah, that journey they kind of make fun they... of me with my bad selfies and all that too. Yeah, there, there's some pretty bad ones <laughs> in there, <Graham. laughs> We're, we're going to have to teach you a little yeah. bit about that. But that they appreciate that you're gone early in the morning to get a ride in or to... Yeah. They yeah. get it, it's your time. I, I think so. I think I think they understand that because they both have their thing too, right? Like Bennett, dance is very, very physical and he needs that. And of course, Jack is, you know, four and five times a week on the, on the ice and uh, when it ends, you know, like in the spring when he stops playing, he, he needs to get to the gym because of right, that. Right. That's it, right? Yeah, Is that, yes, that, you're going to yeah. hang up the skates. Yeah. I don't want you over the next two, three years to become that couch potato that you never were as a kid. That's right. So this, you know, setting that example of there's still... Yeah. There, there is that activity. Yeah. Okay, so you've gone through this parenting. You've gone through these stages. You went through Queen's Park. I mean, you've we've done all of these. You've covered some crazy big stories. Mm-hmm. What was kind of establishing yourself here in this city? How important? I know that there was a, there was a great feature on your home, but just finally feeling like this was home. Yeah. So we've my in laws have a place on Bob's Lake in Westport. So and they've been there since the '90s, and we both went to Queens. So we've we've always sort of looked at possibly way back when that we would finish in the Ottawa area, and it just happened that you know, when I was on Parliament Hill, Max announced that he was going to retire. So it is, um, you know, it, it was, it was completely, it was, Kevin Newman told me that it'll take you six years to be an anchor. Like, come on, Kevin. I, I've been doing, time, it's a right? long time. I've been time. doing this a long I've been, time. I'm a, right? I'm a, I've been in TV I'm since veteran, I was 22. Right? And it took me seven. It really took me seven, seven or eight years, I think, to actually become what in my mind is a local anchor. And and I, I don't know how to describe to you what that is. Well, you described earlier as we were talking what it was like to see young journalists find their story. Yes. And that their body react, body changes, that you could tell the shoulders. Yes. Can you look at yourself from six totally. years ago, how you would anchor a news and how your body, your persona is now. And yes. that it is true. It was the, it was that amount of time needed. Yes. Yes. Wow. And and at the time, going through the first few years, it was okay. I'm not saying that it was horrible, but the audience has to have patience for these jobs, I think. Um, I think you could say the same thing about Lisa Laflamme. I'm not saying that when Lloyd left, mm-hmm. she wasn't excellent. She was. Look at her now compared to back then, you cannot say she has not 
sort of made that show her own. Mm -hmm. And with Patricia, that's what we're that's what we're we're doing. We're we're starting to finish each other's sentences, and it and it's 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 kind of like a dance. And and the 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 thing that I tell young journalists too is that the audience is with you; they're not against you, and they're not keeping score of all your little mistakes, even though in your head you, you think, think they, they are. are. And then that makes it worse. And then you cycle through all of that, right? The audience wants you to succeed, regardless of what social media says, because that's not representative. The audience wants you to succeed. And so when you when you know that and you start to absorb that, and then it's, it really becomes what we are, which is just your neighbors telling you what happened today. And we're part of the family, like we're in your living room and all of those cliches that are true that make local news what it is and it's familiar people telling you what happened today and oh by the way everything's going to be okay like that's Mm -hmm. that's the essence of what of what we do and it takes a while to get there it takes a while to get there but also takes a while to get there from going from your hard news standpoint right like you're coming from politics and parliament hill and queen's park and you you have a different viewpoint of Let's go to the annual fundraiser Absolutely. that's raising money for an important right. It's it's a very different mindset, but to appreciate that this is home, this is what the community wants. And and and, and I we I've made mistakes that you know I wanted to be a tougher anchor. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be a harder newsed anchor, and that's for the reporters. And you can lead a newsroom that has that, but there's a time and a place. And again, in the role. Um, I'm not suggesting that I'm soft peddling things or anything, but is, you have to ask yourself, uh, the mayor is on, the premier is on, You are you going to hammer 17 times one issue, whether it's hydro prices mm-hmm. or anything, or it, 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 is there another way to go at that? And I, I would argue there's another way to go at that, not because I don't think those are legitimate questions but because you're you're in a different frame now you're in a different frame yes you have to you, you they want to see you at chio they want to see you doing all of the great things that local anchors do and they also want to be it to be a welcoming environment and to be your neighbors telling you what's happening so so you've got to, but, it's a much more complex job right, i would which argue which is why it took 6 years sure. 7 years to actually figure out the complexity I think it of it I think it would did. you trade in right now like a week to go cover american politics <laughs> <laughs> like would you trade in to say you know what just for 2 3 days or maybe for the week I, i'm, I'm going to yeah. go join cnn and cover you know the Mueller investigation or the yeah like, oh, yeah. Could I, you still have fun? And, and you know what? What's beauty Are of this you a news junk, junkie? Because totally. right now, like, it's on for 24 hours a day in my house. Totally. And and I I uh, I can do that in mm-hmm. my newsroom. And we do that. We talk about Trump. We talk about, you know, the big issues of the day. And I would, of course, I would love to go down to Washington now. Like Richard Madden's there. Joy Malvin's been there for years for us. And it is it is the biggest story in the world. Mm-hmm. Don, Donald Trump remains the biggest story in the world. So it's very, very difficult to turn away from that do you and think, ever turn it off right do you think had you been a 15 year old boy and it hadn't been tammy faye baker but a donald trump on the news that you would have had that same yeah i gotta fall i gotta figure this oh, story yeah. out i i think so well if it had captured me at 15 absolutely yeah i, I think the, the 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 thing about that particular story that captured me was the right right place at the right time and it was just it was a watershed moment for a lot of people I think now the watershed moment for a lot of people is change, yeah. is is seeing what is happening with Trump and seeing what's happening with this government of this this movement of change. Like, how can we prevent or what what are we doing wrong that this has landed us where we are? So yeah, I have this I have this moment that I keep coming back to. We were in Jay Peak for March break, uh, so in Vermont, in in a very liberal state Mm -hmm. and we're going from the condo to the hill on the shuttle bus and i love talking to americans right and uh they're they never hold back and the vitriol from this bus driver who happened to be white but the vitriol for president obama was shocking like i i i we view obama in a way that millions of americans do not and um i think that I think that we collectively in Canada totally underestimated the anger, the dis- disenfranchisement, whatever you want to say, 
that ultimately propelled a a change agent convention breaker of all convention breakers into the White House. Um, he was treated like a joke even in days leading up to the vote. Like the New York Times on election day had him at and I had Hillary at a 90 or 80% chance of being president. It was a shocking result for so many people because we collectively weren't looking at what, like how how she could not go to Michigan is stunning now, stunning. You look back on it. Oh, yeah. You look back on it and you, and you do, you scratch your head. And I, I love watching some of those documentaries. Right. The circus one, you know. Like yeah. there, there, there was some great coverage when you yeah. look at it now from a very different perspective. And, and, and you know what, Leanne, too? I, I, I've never, I've, I've experienced pressure. Um, I covered Harper and there was an antagonistic relationship between the press and the prime minister's office. There is now with Trudeau to a certain extent. I cannot imagine as an American television reporter covering Trump, what that is like. Like like abuse hurled at you in real time as you're doing live hits from rallies where the, where the president is not saying, hey guys, a free press is important. He's calling them the enemy of the people and riling them up more. It's... Um, it's unprecedented it's it, and it's frightening. Mm -hmm. It is frightening. It is frightening. Um, and I, you know, this, this, this whole notion that he's going to change in the white house. I, I, I go back to what Michelle Obama said, the white house doesn't change you. It reveals who you are. And she's right. She's right. Whether it was George W. Bush, whether it was Ronald Reagan, it reveals who you are. And this is who the president is. The record is absolutely crystal clear and repetitive. He is out, you know, like there's any number of things you can say about him. And um, they're, they're, they're going to they're gonna figure it out in yeah. 2020. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But it's something that you're looking for. Oh. If you, the covering of that, yeah. it's different. Had you still been on the political front, uh -huh. how different it would be. Yeah. But are you sitting there doing that local, local news wishing that you were no. still covering no no no, no. So it's a it's, it's, and i don't say it that because that you did sure i did that part of your past and 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 mm -hmm. i actually got a window into what it's like to be right. a foreign correspondent and uh, it was not for our family it was not for our family there's a high divorce rate you're constantly on a plane it is not glamorous the hours it's are dangerous. punishing and it can be yeah. dangerous it can be dangerous so I'm and I'm thrilled and privileged to be doing what I'm doing and I'm not saying that just to be a corporate guy like there's a reason my particular job in great cities opens up every 30 years literally right. come on right like it's 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 a it's a go-to point for a lot of viewers and uh, and even in this challenging world it's it's a great thing to do are you inspiring people now have you gotten response from people who have been following you who I had been watching your social to watch what it is that you're doing and are trying to motivate yeah. people, right? Like for so many people, you they tune you in, they tune in sure. at six, they get their news. But for people who are now following you and you're seeing, it takes a while too to see that social media presence grow. Yeah, and I'm not great at some of the parts of it. Uh, right, but you're but, getting there. Yeah. But, but you are affecting people in that you have a full-time crazy job yes. that demands a number of different hours from you. Um, and at the same time, you're still finding the time yes. to, to show people that they can accomplish activity and healthy yes. living while working these crazy hours. And, and the thing is, Liam, part of my thing with that is I, I try not to be, I don't want to be preachy because I, I, like, look, if the kids were in diapers, would I be able to do this? Probably not. Uh, the kids are fairly independent. Mm -hmm. And, and, and when I'm, I mean, 365, like I need a couple of hours a day on my own, generally speaking, to do this. And so... I get it when parents can't do that. Um, yeah, when we're getting some back where people are, I'm doing it too. And a friend I've, of mine, yeah. Like, it's, it's oh, I'm wonderful. sorry, but I saw like your, your yeah. co anchor, yes. Patricia Bull. Yeah, she's I doing know, it. she's doing it. Like I've yeah. seen her in the morning and she's walking the dog or she's out skiing with you or yes. you guys. And I'm like, okay, this is the trickle effect. Yeah. It is, it will hit people and yeah. they'll start tagging the 360, what, hashtag 365 days active, active days, right? Yeah, yeah. Is it yeah. active days? Yeah, 365 active days, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I, I got to, uh, the other thing is I stole the idea, of course, <laughs> from Mel Coulson, who used to be an editor at the Ottawa Citizen. And I don't know her, I think I've met her once, but I follow her on Instagram <laughs> and she did it all last year. And so in December, I'm I'm looking at my schedule. I'm like, I'm pretty close here. Why don't I just do it every day and stole the idea? So I started January 1st. And uh, it's, it's it, it, I, I think it's, um, it's just it's a it's a great thing for for me because 
um, it, it gives me an outlet. The other thing is people are curious, right? They want to see mm-hmm. not just you reading the news. Uh, and, I, and that's not obviously why I'm doing it. And I don't post every day on, on Instagram because I find if I did that, for me, it's that whole like people are getting sick of me. It's too much. I find that there's a science behind it is if you're posting to have a post or if you're doing your Insta stories and yes. I actually enjoy it. And I've, to be honest with you, I've liked knowing that you've had an hour of bike ride and you've shared the sunset. Yeah. Because you know what, if you, if you get up early enough and yeah. if you do this, you too can experience this. It's a wonderful part of life. And the other thing too is this city, mm-hmm. I mean, you can't beat it. You cannot beat it. Like I, I'm lucky enough. I live close, but I'm, I'm a 12 K ride to to Gatineau Park and it's some some of the most stunning skiing and and uh, and riding in anywhere in the country so I that that's the other reason why I love doing it do you intend on doing more I know you bike often with Todd Hamilton yes who is uh, also at the at the station yeah. who has gone for longer Ugh. long journeys yes where do you see yourself like are do you have an endpoint do you have a goal do you have something now that's like okay I'm getting through these 365 but I'm going to be really strong after all of this so let's do something so I have a goal uh for my number for my weight when I get on the bike in the spring and I'm about four pounds away from that and it's not about losing weight I you know I'm not doing that I I want to be a certain number when I get on the bike in the spring and I'm getting there and then what I did last year was without doing 365, I, I kind of built to the longest ride I've ever done. And it was 220K. It was a seven, six hour, six and a half hour ride down to the St. Lawrence Seaway and back. And that was intense. And I did it by myself, which was intense. Why by yourself? Um, it just, it kind of worked out that way. Okay. And I just had spare time coming up. Like a full s- seven hours to get on. Yeah, yeah. so go. I left at like you, six in the morning or five in the morning. And you sore? Like, could you move the next day? Yeah, I was fine. Wow. I was fine. So those- Like, it, like even the seat aspect? Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, even down wow. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long time. Well, the, the thing is people, these bikes now, these carbon fiber yeah. bikes, people think it's the weight. It's not the weight, it's the comfort. Like okay. you can yeah. you can ride them for a long period of time. So anyway- um, uh, so yeah, I'm going to build to another goal like that, but my main goal is to get through 365 and December 31st have done physical activity every day for a year. I think it's amazing. I, you I could really do. do. I, I You're probably, probably I are probably, doing it. I probably am in a certain sense, sure. but not being accountable right. for it. And the days and the days that I take off, it's just that it was impossible for me to get in. Yes. But psychologically for me, if I don't get it in, I'm just not a very nice person yeah like i need the adrenaline i need the endorphins and when i have that my brain everything just works better yeah do you incorporate a change in food like did being Mm -hmm. this active change how you eat how you are yeah yeah we're we're both doing yeah we're both trying to this we're doing this whole life challenge thing for Mm -hmm. six weeks and you know uh is leanne feeling good yeah she's feeling great she looks great like you know like you're yeah you're, i'm not gonna say but you're closing it closing in more on 50 absolutely and yet trying to feel the best you've ever felt like yes. would you say that I, it's I possible like i keep telling people it drives me nuts when people are like oh well i'm almost 50 why and i'm like are you crazy you have the best years still so, to feel and to do things and it drives me nuts that people throw in the towel and I'm like you have no clue a couple of years ago i read this book um and it was geared towards men who are over 50 live like you're 50 for the rest of your life um and his 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 basic thesis is and it's a doctor and a lawyer who wrote it and it's a bestseller, but his basic thesis is you need to get your heart pumping every day. And his 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 thing is six five to six days a week. And if you're in your 40s and you have kids, I'll give you five days a week. And his whole thing is not, it's not about the heart and the weight. When you're doing that, you are sending signals to your entire body that you're still hunting and gathering, right? So this is the first time in our in the evolution of human history that we've been able to go to a fast food place and get plentiful food for cheap prices, right? Mm-hmm. Like people people were walking and working physically and working the farm not that long ago. And so this is the first generation where sedentary lifestyle is impacting our lifespan and our health and and his his he makes the physiological and the scientific argument that the the pumping of heart and the moving of blood through the body sends signals to the brain that you are still out looking for food which is thousands of years of evolution 
And that in itself is health. And when it will, will make your life long. You can live like you're 50 until you're into your 80s and even into your 90s. Because his other point is, is that with replacement knees and hips and everything, mm-hmm. when you stop moving, that's when life ends. And if you can keep moving, which science allows us in Western democracies now, you, you can do that. And I, I it, it kind of changed my outlook on things. I, I shared it with my father-in-law and he started love to- love it. Yeah. I yeah know, that's going to be one of the first things to say. So live, what's the, how, what's the title? The, the t- and I forget yeah. the author's name, but live like you're 50 uh, for the rest of your life. It's a yellow book and it's a bestseller on Amazon and it's easily okay. findable. I'll have to find it. I'll try and, to and it, find Even, you know, for, it's, it's geared towards men, mm-hmm. um, but it, it, lots of truth there for women as well, obviously. I love that concept. Yeah. Okay, what's the current book on your bedside table? Uh, the current book on my bedside table, <laughs> it's, it's the, I'm not a history geek, but on, uh, I'm reading about the final days of the First World War, the Armistice Day. And did you know, Leanne Lang, I didn't know this, that soldiers were sent, thousands of them, up and over the trenches to fight the Germans on the 11th of November before 11 a.m., even though the armistice was signed. The Americans were late in the war, and this is an American author, and th- thousands of soldiers died on the 11th. It, it's, it's, it's insane. It's the, it's the insanity of the Great War uh, right up until the last minute, literally 10.30 in the morning, and the armistice took effect 11. Some of the American generals wanted medals and wanted commendations, so of course the soldiers had to pay the price. Some of them didn't want to carry the artillery back so they fired all their guns so they didn't have to pull them out. It's just oh my God. stunning. Anyway, that's, that's, what's, on, that's, what's, on that's what's on my bedside table, bedside table right now. Bed. Okay, you're going to leave here. What's the first meal? What are you going to eat? Uh, I've got, oh, I've got vegetable soup that I made in the, uh, yeah. in the uh, uh, not the crock pot, the uh, Instapot. Oh, that new thing. I haven't. I haven't oh, it's great. It's a yeah. steamer and everything. So I've got, I'm, I'm going to have that for lunch. Yeah. Uh, I made a vegetable soup, froze it, and then... And then the show ends at 7, you're home. Ends and at then... 7, I'm home at uh, 7.15, 7.20. Uh, if I'm walking, yep. I'm home at a quarter to 8, 10 to 8. Okay, dinner, boys um, hockey. Oh, Leanne's got a stew going uh, ah. in, in the slow cooker, right? It, that's the other thing we're trying to do uh, is plan. She does it way better than I do, plan the family meal yep. because uh, both boys are on their way out the door. So, you know, feeding. I love it. Yeah. yeah. It's, and you do, you do way more preparation, right? You do Sundays. I do Sunday prep. Yeah, that's but great. But it's not cooking because no. everyone knows I'm not actually, I don't really cook. Right. But I have like everything chopped. I have like hard boiled eggs done. I have all my veggies cooked all and everything's uh, sorry, cut uh, so, so that I just can snacks. literally grab and it's a healthier snack option. That's smart. And I have like the, I, I, and I still do the full fat. Like I'll have sour cream with onion dip. Sure. So I'll take the carrots with the onion dip and I'll take the, so I just do it that way. That's great. But I, I'm not the, I don't do full meals. I but don't even also, have, I don't even have a crock pot. But you eat. also don't, you probably don't grab a lot of processed crap. No. Yeah. See, that's good. No. And I don't grocery shop that way too. I limit myself in the aisles. That's good. Right? So you go shop on the outskirts. You know this, right? You know this trick? No. When you go grocery shopping, everything that you need is, is, on, on, the the out, is on the outskirts. If you think about it, you walk yes. in, everything, all the vegetables, all your eggs, everything, every, the milks, everything, juices, everything's on the outside. The only thing that are really in the in the Bad rows stuff. is processed, packaged. So there are. I try to limit uh, very, very few items. I try not to even go down the aisles. That's good. Yes, and that's how I do it. And then wow. I make sure I can see all the colors of the rainbow on the conveyor belt to know that I've covered my colors of the rainbow. See? Wow. Little tricks of the trade. Okay, we have gone way over. Have we? Yeah, oh, yeah and, I guess and we have. then Veronica, yeah, and so. Do you this know, was by great. the way, my mother FaceTimed us from Thailand. And you, <laughs> and you were, said no? I didn't I didn't pick it up. Oh. And I, should, should, I have, should I have taken my mom's Mom? FaceTime? <laughs> you should have. I'm sorry. I, tell her you're I, talking to Richardson and never so stops. So I always, I always have my phone on with me when I do the, the podcast because I time it. Yeah. So I kind of, and I'm usually pretty good. I looked at my at the at the timer. It was 59 minutes. I'm like, okay, I got to wrap this up. But my I looked down and my mom was FaceTime timing she's in thailand they were doing this cruise anyway it looked spectacular graham it's awesome we're gonna have to do this again we'll figure out what's happening thanks for having me yeah it was awesome and uh it's been uh, wonderful this is great and thank i'm you. so thrilled for you thank you I'm, i i really do i love this process so make sure you tell your friends make sure you share the podcast I will. this is my time when i tell people 
Go like and subscribe and share and let people know that this podcast is out there. It continues to grow. We've got great engagement. You can watch it on YouTube. And then, of course, you can take it to any of the platforms on Spotify and on Google Play and iTunes. Gosh, it's everywhere. And uh, that's a wrap. Graham, thanks so much. Thanks, Leanne.